detour were left here with the Duchess's biggest fan, Riptides. No, 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 no. Fuck you, you oompa loompa son of a bitch. Fuck you. Nope. And today we are reviewing the 2001 Backlash event that took place on... I want to touch you with a 10-foot pole. Okay, as I was saying, we are reviewing the 2001 Backlash pay-per-view that took place on April 29, 2001 in Rosemont, Illinois. Obviously, booked hyped as Chicago, even though that sounds on the outskirts. It was at the All-State Arena with 15,594 fans, or, or 15,592 fans. Jeez, I can't. I read for shit today. It's not like a couple miles down the road from Chicago. That's why they just call it Chicago. Yes. So, before we go into this event, talking about it, shout out to the Sunday Night Heat match where it was Jerry Lynn defeating light heavyweight champion Crash Holly in a singles match to win that title. They actually touched, like, briefed on, briefly touched on that during the show itself. And a shout out to the other Sunday Night Heat match from this event, which was leader defeating Molly Holly in a one on one match. <laughs> so the match kicked off properly with a six man tag team match. It was your boys, X Factor. No. Of X Fox, Just Incredible, and Albert taking on all three Dudley boys, Bubba Ray, Devon, and Spike. No. Okay, so what stood out to you for in this particular six-man tag opener? All the fucking Dudley boys attack the fucking uh, X Factor. Yep. It's like it was. It was like your standard Attitude Era type match. Six-man tag. It was chaotic, wild all the way through. There was. Spike was getting double teamed. Devon was getting triple teamed. Of course, X Factor had to cheat to win. Yeah. I think it was what? X Pot getting the pinfall over Devon, but then the Dudleys got their heat back. Or I thought he pinned Bubba Ray. They they put his ass through a table. Yeah, after the match was after X Pot got the win over Bubba Ray. All three, all three Dudleys got their revenge, which eventually ended with X Pac getting Brady to the table, and the other two running off like little bitches. <laughs> so yeah, X Factor may have won the match, but they lost the war for this opening match. Yep. So your thoughts on this? Uh, so your thoughts on this six man? Like, was it a good way good. to start? Was it a good way to start? I mean, not. Not really big crazy spots really stood out to me, but it was something. Just a decent yeah, way to open the show. More, it was more of a brawl than anything. Yeah, and even though the heels won, they got their comeuppance in the end anyway. Yeah, at this point, it was also where X Factor was kind of going downhill. Yep. Huh. <sighs> So, so I think like a couple months later after this pay-per-view, they broke up. Yeah, I know they had the, I think it was shortly after this event, they had the Uncle Cracker theme song, but they didn't last too much longer after that. Yeah. And I know you were just, dis- oh yeah, and speaking of which, I know the, I know we keep freaking forgetting to do this, but the hype package for it was hyping up the main event tag match. Also, I keep forgetting to talk about that. Of course, you were disappointed because your boys RTC weren't even in this event. No, hell no. <laughs> They're your boys because you're the one that likes to have your channel PG. Have you met my? Have you seen any video in my on my channel? I'm not PG. Yes, you are. You're PG rated R. Yeah, go fuck yourself. If I was PG, would I say that? <laughs> I don't think so, Scooter. But the six-man tag is like, it wasn't the greatest six-man tag match I've ever seen. It was more like a, like I said, it was more like an Attitude Era style brawl. 
more or everything anything else. I mean, it was a good match for what it was. Yeah. And then we got introduced to your woman, the Duchess, backstage. No. Fuck you. <laughs> we all know that's your woman. You were fantasizing me like, I wonder what she looks like without that powdered wig. No, that's you. You just admitted that you were fantasizing about it. No. Yes. We all know that's what you want to be with. No, no, <laughs> no. That's We all know that's what your ugly Oompa Loompa ass wants. No. <laughs> yes. And who are you calling an ugly ass Oompa Loompa? You. <laughs> I don't know. I may be fair on you, but you got the Oompa Loompa hairstyle. I do not. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm pretty sure they would go for you. You got a mustache. Just because I have a mustache does not make me gay. Porn mustache. Go fuck yourself, you son of a bitch. Go shove a giant fucking John Holmes sized dildo up your ass. Be no. like, nah, Jesus Christ. Where did this go from reviewing this show to blatantly insulting each other? We just got to the first <laughs> match. It always does. It's hilarious. And people wonder why my channel is not monetized. Anyway. <laughs> probably probably because of statements like that, but I digress. But anyway, the next match on this card was for the Hardcore Championship. Is it, as Rhino was defending the Hardcore title against... Raven. Yep. This match was entertaining for its own right, more than it really had to be. I mean, hell, it's the first time I remember seeing a shopping cart get used as a weapon. No, they've used shopping carts for those weapons before. It's what? the first time you've seen Rhino go through the goddamn shopping cart like that. I guess we will have to see how much his ass cost. <laughs> 50 cents. Well, back then, well, back then, I would say he was worth about a he was worth about two hundred dollars, but adjusted for inflation, about twenty grand. <laughs> yes, that's a joke, even though it sucks. Can't get off the cats. But anyway, plenty of weapon shots done in this one. We even seen a trash can lid off of Raven's skull. That looked nasty. <laughs> well, we saw. Uh him go uh, get face planted right into a fucking stop sign. Yep. And then we we I think we actually seen the yeah we actually seen the shopping cart get yeeted at one point at someone's head. Yeah. But in the end, when Raven was doing more trying to do more devastating damage, he got hit with a gore, and Rhino actually retains the hardcore title. What a hardcore title match with a champion retains? That's rare. He was trying to hit him with the kitchen sink. Try to hit, yeah, he brought everything. Raven brought everything in the kitchen sink, and it wasn't even enough to win that back that hardcore dial. Yeah. Not as chaotic as the WrestleMania 17 hardcore title match, obviously, but still passable as a good brawl, hardcore brawl for that championship. Yeah. And then after that match was done, we go. They did briefly talk about the whole Shane McMahon, Big Show, Last Man Standing match. And then we went and then we went also backstage of catering where your woman the Duchess was back there again. No. I guess she didn't want any burnt wieners. No, she didn't want your burnt wiener. <laughs> she didn't she want your, your uncooked she, sausage. She didn't want your burnt wet meat. <laughs> she wanted your unburnt sausage. Yeah. But then, like, Jonathan Coachman came up to her and asked, what are the rules for a Dungeons of Queensberry match? And right before she even got to say anything, William Regal, I'll be like, nope, I ain't revealing shit. <laughs> now, the next match, speaking of that, the next match was the Duchess of Queensberry's role match, and Jesus Christ talked about rigged. Yeah. There was no way in hell Jericho could win this at all, because... Oh, yeah, the match was between Chris Jericho and William Regal in a WrestleMania 17 rematch. And after some good back and forth, Jericho did put Regal in the walls of Jericho only for... Actually, no, he, did, he got a... 
You got a pinfall. Look like you got a visual pinfall victory at first, only for the bell to ring. And being like, oh, this was just the end of round one. Match continues. I'm like, what? Like, oh, no, he got the walls of Jericho. And then later on, he got the walls of Jericho on him. Oh, this match can't end in submission. And then Regal blatantly used uh, the scepter that the Desert had at ring. He's like, oh, yeah, there's no disqualification. And, uh,. And after all that frustration that was building up and building up, Jericho had enough, finally snapped, took your woman into the ring and applied the walls of Jericho on her. Your woman, you son of a bitch. <laughs> yeah. I swear powdered wigs were flying everywhere, but... <laughs> but Jericho got you're hit. But Jericho got, hit, but Jericho got distracted enough where Regal came in, hit Jericho in the back three times with a steel chair, and got the win. Okay, your thoughts of this clusterfuck of a match? It was some good brawl. Of course, just like at WrestleMania, Regal got so many knife-ass chops that his chest was completely red, like you'd see Gunther do to people today. Yeah. But, ugh. It was kind of real. I understand the story they were telling to put that feud to bed, but... It just, it was fucked from the start. It was an obvious Regal was going to win. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, it was unique for what it was. I'm glad we never got a match like that again. <laughs> yeah. So therefore, we covered the only event with your dream woman. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, let's talk about, like, right before the Duchess got attacked, when Jericho freaking, like, dropped to home or, like, you know what, or, like, made freaking Regal go right into her, right between his leg, right between her legs there, and he got, a, and Regal got out, looked all shocked, like I seen a ghost. I swear, yeah. I swear, the facial expressions that really Regal gave in his day were, is underestimated. He gave perfect ones for the moment. That are like meme worthy. Yeah. Before memes, way before memes were a thing. Yeah. But yeah, I find Regal's facial expression one of the entertaining, one of the few entertaining things about this match, this rigged match between the two. But that was about it. The rest of it was just too predictable. What could go? What could happen? Yeah. But anyway, moving on from that match. Um, we go ultimately to what I think is the best match of the night by far. And I ain't gonna repeat it again, but this one involves a freaking controversial superstar. But this, but I'm talking about, the, but this next match was a 30 minute ultimate submission match between Kurt Angle and Chris Benoit. Yeah. I mean, we gave our feelings about Benoit in previous videos. We don't need to repeat it here. If you want to know, go to some of our older reviews. Yeah. But uh, straight off the bat, these two, once again, delivered. Back and forth style, ten technical style wrestling. Back and forth right off the gig, like the WrestleMania 17 encounter. Well, Benoit was always a technical wrestler. And Kurt Angle, I always viewed as his equal. And of course, and of course, the first submission happened when Angle forced Benoit to submit with a leg lock to score at one and zero. Yeah. In favor of Angle at that point. It's like, but then a little bit later on, a little later on, Benoit forced Angle to submit to the cross arm bar, arm breaker, tying the score one to one. Yeah. And after some more back and forth, Angle finally got the angle lock on Benoit to make to make Benoit tap out once again, making the score two to one. Yeah. <laughs> then shortly after that, Angle actually got a little cocky 
and put Benoit in his own submission hold the cross face, making Benoit to tap out to that, making the score three to one in favor of Angle. Yeah, but also that was also after Angle had already attacked him too. Yeah. Yeah, attacked him. Also, yeah, he attacked him and then put the cross face on him. Yep. I mean, at this point, it wasn't looking good for the Crippler at this point, right? Yeah. But then Benoit did get did fight back. He wasn't going to be a bitch. He did fight back and actually uh, put a single leg Boston Crab on an angle, which actually... Yeah, he put a boss, single leg Boston Crab with his knee on Angle's back. Like, really getting the pressure in, right? Yep. Making the score 3-2. to two, Still in Angle's favor. <laughs> and then... And then, uh, and then, like... Sh- and then after that, after a little bit of wrestling more after that... Freaking Benoit humiliated Angle by making Angle submit to his own... To Angle's own angle lock submission hole, just like Angle forced Benoit to tap to the cross race, making it even three to three. Yes. And this was like within the last four minutes of this 30 minute contest. And these two would just go back and forth and back and forth until the time expired, which within the last, like, I believe 10 seconds, Angle had Benoit on the angle lock. And right when the bell rang, signifying that the match was over, that's when Benoit was tapping out, so it didn't count. Yes. So this match ultimately looked as if it was going to end in a draw between the two, which would have been BS. That means there'd be no definitive winner. But then the referee was like, screw it, we ain't ending it that way. We're going into overtime, next person to submit loses. (laughs) The match period, right? Yeah. And after about a little over a minute of overtime, making the match time a little over 31 minutes, Benoit actually put Angle into the crippler cross face, and despite trying to get to the ropes, he couldn't do it, and Angle ended up tapping out, making the final match result 4-3. to With Benoit getting the win here, and getting revenge for what happened to him at WrestleMania 17 in their last encounter. So... Your your thoughts judging this match fairly? Like, what did you think about this whole this whole long ass thirty one minute match? Well, it was them deciding who was the best technical wrestler. So, I bet you had a fun time watching it as much as I did. Yeah, I always have fun watching uh, his matches. Yep. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I got I have to. I, I had to sit here and judge it fairly. And my final score for that will be will be discussed <laughs> a little later. Yeah. But yeah, I thought that. Was, I, I thought the submission thirty minute submission match was the best match on this card so far. But the next match we had, it was Simba versus Mufasa two. <laughs> Which way did he go? Which way did he go? <laughs> Remember that from the Judgment Day 2000 review? Yes. But this time it was Big Show versus Shane McMahon in a last man standing match. This yep. time with the roles of the heel and face reversed. With Big Show coming in as the heel while Shane was McMahon was the face. No. And this, yeah, and this came about after Shane defeated Vince McMahon and Big Show decided to step in and defend Vince's honor against Shane and stay with WWE instead of going to WCW with Shane. And then then we had Shane in the Beanstalk story. Yep. That was pretty much played throughout this show. It was supposed to it was, it was, this is like a fairy tale. It's Jack in the Beans, but the boy is now going to be Shane O'Matt. Yep. Yeah, Big Show made his entrance, and then when Shane McMahon came out, he just started trying to attack Big Show as much as he can with all kinds of weapons he could find, including uh, that one keep-off 
tray, whatever you want to call it, sign, whatever you want to call it. Even whack, and even whack Big Show in the head with a book. I'm like, yeah, hit yourself in the head with a book. You may become smart. Yeah. <laughs> That's the joke that was going through my head seeing that. And then Shaman Man then took out a kendo stick and it looked like he was going to jump on the Big Show from the barrier, barrier only for Big Show to reverse it and knock down Shane with a clothesline. Yeah. And then Big Show just continued the onslaught and punishment onto Shane McMahon, including several choke slams in the ring. And he could have ended it if he wanted to. But no, wait, wait, before that, before that, sorry, we got to talk about the chloroform spot first. Yeah. While Big Show was in the ring, Shane McMahon got another upper hand, took a bag out, put put one of those like face masks over his face. Remember those? Yes. From not too recent, from not too, from the not too recent past. Yes, the N95s. Yes, and then, yeah, and then freaking he uh, put chloroform or whatever substance over this rag and put it over the Big Show's face, making him pass out temporarily until Vince McMahon came out and just beat the hell out of Shane with a chair. No. And then he took, and then Vince took that bag away, whatever. And then Big Show got the upper hand, and then he gave the multiple choke slams onto Shane McMahon. And Big Show could have ended it right then and there if he wanted to, but he got made the mistake by lifting Shane McMahon up over and over repeatedly. And then those two, and then Shane and Big Show would fight each other all the way to the entrance ramp, and that's where Test interfered. Yeah. On Shane McMahon's behalf. Test getting revenge on Big Show for what Show did to him uh, on SmackDown a few weeks prior to this event. Yeah. Yeah, and then while that was going on, Shane McMahon was climbing the staging area, the backlash staging area, like all the way to the top of the Titantron or the entrance stage, like about, looked like a 50-foot drop, right? Well, he climbed up all the way to the fucking rafter and then fucking prayed to God that he didn't miss. Yeah, and then when Big Show was laid out, Shane McMahon actually freaking dove off of it, performed an elbow on Big Show, and both were out. Yes. And then, yeah, and while the count was going, test the obvious innovator or the ultimate opportunist took the freaking boom camera Freaking put Shane's unconscious prone body on it and held it upright, symbolizing, yep, Shane's on his feet for the 10 count for Shane to win the match. Now, your thoughts yeah. on this wild last man standing match, specifically near the end? It was interesting to see Big Show versus Shane again. And then Tess has to. Put his big ass into it. Yeah, there was interference for Shane in this match, just like their last encounter nearly a year prior to this event. But either way, Simba got the victory in the Lion King 2 tail. <laughs> right? Uh huh. But you know. It was a good match for what it was. It was good. It was a good brawl near the end, but it was mostly dominated by Big Show in the beginning. So yeah, I guess I can say it was kind of like back and forth. Oh, in a way, it was. Now the yeah. next, now the semi-main, the palate cleanser match was a triple threat match for the European Championship. It was Matt Hardy defending his newly won European title, who he defeated Eddie Guerrero for. On the SmackDown Briar defending against the former champion Guerrero and Christian in a triple threat match. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this triple threat match really wasn't. This triple threat match, I believe, was the weakest on the card. I hate saying that about a Guerrero match, but it kind of was. It was a rushed match because they wanted to get to the main event. And neither, neither, neither of the three, who, the only established single star during that match at that point was Eddie Guerrero. Christian and Matt Hardy had yet to prove that at 
that point in their careers. Not like they are now, right? Yeah. So, anyway... Anyway, none of them really had the advantage, but then Edge interfered, performing a spear on Matt Hardy near the end, and then Jeff Hardy came out and interfered, evening the odds for Matt here. While, while, while that was going on, Christian did perform an unhurry on Guerrero, but Jeff Hardy broke up the pin. Yeah. With a, with a Swam Tom bomb finisher, and then Matt hit the twist of fate on Christian for the 1 2 3 to retain the championship. Probably one of the quickest triple threat matches I've seen, but. Yeah. It, it, it was what it was, you know. The fact that they didn't want to take the European title off of Matt Hardy after he just won it days prior, I understand. But it didn't need but it didn't need to be a hell of a quick match. But it was, you gotta think, attitude era. Matches were really quick back then compared to today's standards. You really can't compare it past to today. Yeah. So what's your thoughts on this pre on this triple threat club? This triple threat match. Club club this guy, okay, this guy dang just chill for a while and rest match. Shit. Or Clallop. I can't fucking pronounce shit. You Clallop. can't talk. You have dick in your mouth. Fuck off. <laughs> this, like, cool down match. That's what it was really is. It was a good match. It was... It was just very interesting to see it in a triple threat, which you could have probably done it on Monday or Friday or whatever, whichever they were on. So you're saying it was more, it probably felt more suited for a Raw or SmackDown show. Yes. But, you know, they had to have like some kind of rest match between the last man standing and the big main event. So that's what they went with. And speaking of main event, that was the next. The main event was the next match on the card, as it was, as it was the Undertaker and Kane defending the tag team championships against the WWE champion Steve Austin and the Intercontinental Champion Triple H, with Stephanie McMahon in their corner in a winner take all tag team match. Yep, it was the Brothers of Destruction versus the Two Man Ho Trip. And this was kind of an interesting situation because because of, like, say, if Austin pinned Kane, then Austin and Triple H would be the tag champions. However, if, say, Taker pinned Triple H, Triple H would be the Intercontinental Champion. If no, Kane... it, no the, the thing was, that if Austin got pinned, whoever pinned Austin would be uh, WWE champion. the Federation Champion. If Triple H got pinned, whoever pinned Triple H would have been the Intercontinental Champion. So if Kane pinned Triple H, he would have been the Intercontinental Champion. Yeah. If Kane pinned Austin, he would have been the, the uh, Federation. Federation Champion. But if the one, if Triple H and Austin pinned either the Undertaker or Kane, they, they would have been the tag team champions. champions. So yeah, this basically was. Pretty much winner take all here. Yes. <laughs> and I like the story that they were telling with Kane's arm being damaged and busted up, or at least his elbow. But for the most part, it was a back and forth attitude era style brawl. These were the four four of the biggest names that came out of that era. Yeah. Yeah, and then after. And, and, and the Undertaker was take the Undertaker was out in there, and even when he was in trouble, Kane was like, "Tag me," and Taker was like, "Nope, you're injured, right? You've seen that." Well, he didn't really want to tag in Kane that much because of his freaking elbow. Yep. Yeah, and then yeah, and then at one point, Kane tagged himself in anyway, much to the dismay of. Taker, right? Yeah. But Kane went in there, started cleaning house, but then he got taken out. He got taken out, but he did, but then Kane 
Yeah, and then Triple H performed a pedigree on Kane, and then Austin went to go pin him, but Taker broke it up. Yeah. Then Kane was going for a big boot or something. Austin caught it. On, or actually, no, I think Kane was trying to tag out, but then Austin grabbed his foot. Kane got up and hit the enziguri on Austin. Right? Yeah. Because, he, and because of that, Austin collided with the referee in the match. And then the Undertaker, so called, got tagged in, but the referee didn't see it. But the Undertaker went in there and cleaned house anyway, including performing a last ride on Triple H. Right? Well, yeah. Well, you think the freaking refs are going to stop the t- Undertaker? No. Well, this one no. did. Because the Undertaker went for the pit on Triple H. No. We saw the tag. Undertaker should be the legal man, but the referee did not see it. So we went to pin Triple H. Referee's like, no, I'm not counting it. You're not legal. No. I didn't see no pin. That means Kane was still a legal man in the referee's mind. He saw no pin. You mean he saw no tag? Yep. And then, and then Kane came back in, started cleaning house some more. Oh, and then, at one point, she. At one point, Stephanie McMahon came back into the ring, got into the ring, and she got a big boot by Kane, which that got a big fan pop. Yeah. Only for Vince McMahon at that point to come out. Vince McMahon had the sledgehammer. You know where this is going. Uh Uh-huh. And then when Kane was about to choke slam, freaking Vince right out of his million-dollar suit, Triple H took the sledgehammer, hit Kane in the injured shoulder or injured elbow with it at first. Putting Kane down, and while this was going on, Taker and Austin were fighting and threw out the crowd. All right, and then yeah. and then Triple H took that same sh- same sledgehammer and nailed Kane in the head with it, which can only be seen on replay because whoever was operating the camera angles at that point sucked. Yeah, had their, you had one job and you couldn't do it. Well, they can never do their damn job. Because, yeah, right when Triple H was about to swing the sledgehammer at Kane's head, that's when the camera was like, nope, I'm going to go over here to Vince McMahon now. And then Triple H went for the pinfall, so we only got to see the last sledgehammer shot during a replay of what happened through the uh, hard cam. Yeah. But anyway, after that, Triple H pinned Kane, one, two, and three. And even though the Undertaker managed to get back in the ring, he couldn't stop the count. Yeah. Thus giving Austin and Triple H the tag titles, thus making them hold all the gold to end the show. So, and I know I didn't go through every move spot for spot here, but what's your thoughts about this wild main event? It was a good match where they were talking, where they were saying... Uh, well, they're setting up more of a story with uh, Steve Austin going to be going to be betraying, yeah, uh, Triple H in the in the end, anyways. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this match was really to set up the two the two single matches at the 2001 Judgment Day pay per view between Austin and Taker and Triple H and Kane. Yeah. For the Intercontinental and WWE Championships at the time, respectively. I know this was WWF, but I'm still used to just calling it WWE over the last 20 plus years. Same company, just bear with me. Anyway. Now, that was Backlash 2001 in a nutshell. So, let's do what we do at the end of every... At the end of every show that we review and talk about in in somewhat detail. Let's go to our star ratings for each of these matches that took place. X Factor defeating the Dudley Boys in that six man tag. There was an alright, decent opener for what it was, but I gotta give it two and a half out of five. It was a three. So basically, average, yeah. Hardcore champion Rhino successfully defending against Raven in that wild, out of, that wild hardcore match. I give it. I give it three and a half. Raven brought everything in the kitchen sink. That's where half the point comes from. <laughs> it was a four. Hmm. William Regal defeating Chris Jericho in whatever the hell a Duchess of Queensberry rules match was. That Two. whole 
the bugle. I give it one and a half. I give it two. Yeah, it really wasn't a great match. The, the WrestleMania 17 encounter was better. Chris Benoit defeating Kurt Angle 4-3 in the Sun Death Overtime of the 30-minute alternate submission match. There's no debating this one. It, for me, it was 5 out of 5. It was a 5 out of 5, yeah. Yep. Shane McMahon defeating Big Show in a last man standing match. I give that 4 out of 5. 4 and a half. Yep. European champion Matt Hardy defeating Christian and Eddie Guerrero in that triple threat match. Three. Two. I say three. I only give it one extra. I only give it one extra star than you did because it was a Guerrero match. And of course, the main event with Austin and Triple H defeating under defeating the Undertaker and Kane to hold all the gold. To hold the WWE Intercontinental and Tag Team Championships at the end. Yeah. Uh, a solid four and a half. So what'd I you, say five. All right. So overall, my overall grade for the 2001 Backlash event is a solid high B grade. A. <laughs> you give it an A, I give it a B. So, yeah, that's our thoughts on the 2001 Backlash pay-per-view event. But, next week, it is my turn to pick a freaking show we're going to review. And I know this event that we just did was from 2001, but on the timeline... On the classic pay-per-view timeline, I am going to jump ahead 16 years to something that happened more in the modern, near the modern time period. And it's a SmackDown exclusive pay-per-view, Cold and Chain, Steel. Yes, if you haven't noticed, if you haven't put together the clues right now, the next paper we re- paper we're going to be reviewing is the 2017 Elimination Chamber event. Okay. And for one reason, let me in. It was his first win against Cena. It's like, let me in. Uh-huh. Anyway, we hope you enjoyed our 2000 review or 2001 review of Backlash. Or Backlash 2001 review. What? He wasn't the fiend at that point. He was uh, the world eater. I know, but still. (laughs) But still, everyone associates him with that phrase. Well, everyone also associates him with saying, I have the whole world We're here. in my hands. He has the whole world in his hands. And yes, at the Chamber 17, he literally had the whole world in his hands. Yeah, it was his first title win. Yeah, that's going to be emotional to watch back, but we'll watch it back anyway and judge it fairly. Anyway, well, anyway with that being said, we'll see you next week when we review the 2017 Elimination Chamber event. And we will talk to you all later. Peace. Deuces.